Silicon Graphics Computer Systems, or SCI, was a California tech company founded in 1981, mainly specializing in graphical computing, with their first product being a terminal with pretty cool graphical capabilities. Later on, they started making Unix workstations, like the Personal Iris, Iris Crimson, as seen in Jurassic Park, and the Iris Indigo, just to name a few. I've always been a big fan of SCI as a company, and what their technology brought to the table. If SGI's tech wasn't available at that time, movies like Jurassic Park, The Abyss, Toy Story, and Shrek probably would not be what they are today. SGI also provided the graphics hardware for the Nintendo Ultra 64, which later became the Nintendo 64, with SGI machines also aiding in the development. So the system I have in front of me today is the SGI Indigo 2 from 1993, which is basically the sequel to the 1991 SGI Indigo, which at its time was the king of high-end graphical workstations. So all of SGI's machines were really aimed at the high-end and prosumer markets. So these are not the type of machines you would see at a Fry's Electronics or a Circuit City, up against a Dell or a Compaq. These were very high-end graphical workstations, and I've been wanting one of these for a very long time. Let's go check it out. So there's actually quite a few versions of the SGI Indigo 2, the IP22, the IP26, and the IP28. The later ones, aka the IP28, you might have actually seen before. This is the SGI Indigo 2 Impact 10,000. Impact meaning it has SGI's Impact graphics, and 10,000 meaning that it has a MIPS R10,000 CPU. And that is pretty much the highest spec Indigo 2 that you can get. The IP28s are insane and can hold up to a gigabyte of RAM which was absolutely unheard of in 1995 when this thing came out. I would love to track these down and make a video on it one day. There's also the Challenge M, which is basically just an Indigo 2 but without a graphics option installed, basically acting like a desktop server. Now, an honorable mention that I honestly cannot find any information about if this actually was released or not is this. It appears to be a red Indigo 2. I have no idea what it's called or if it was ever released or if anybody even owns one, although I did see this picture, so I thought I would mention it here. So how did I end up with this Indigo 2? Well, I know a friend who also knows a friend, basically. If you went to the Seattle Interim Computer Festival, you might have seen this exact Indigo 2 there. Yeah, this is that Indigo 2. So when I bought the system, it was in Washington. But coincidentally enough, I actually had a trip to Portland planned literally the week after I bought it. Portland was great, by the way. It's my home city after all, and I was just glad to be back home. So I met up with my friend who then dropped the Indigo 2 off and my eyes were glued to the thing for a while. Also, yes, that is my Macintosh SE. You can tell that I wanted to move back to Portland because I brought way too much shit for this trip. Then me and my friend checked out some uh, other things, and then after my week in Portland was up, I took the Indigo 2 back to California on a train. And now we're back here. The machine I have is a Teal IP22 from 1993. And this system is equipped with a MIPS R4400 at 200 megahertz, with an R4010 floating point chip right beside it. This also has 128 megabytes of RAM, and mine has Express Graphics, aka the GR3 Elon. The GR3 Elon is one of the more higher-end pre-impact GPUs that shipped with the Indigo 2. I say pre-impact because impact graphics for the Indigo 2 didn't come out until 1995. Let's talk a little bit more about how the GR3 Elon functions, because honestly it's really cool. The GR3 Elon is a double stack board configuration, and don't be confused, this is not SLI. These are two different parts of the graphics subsystem. The top board, known as the VB2, has all external connectors and I.O., and also has the RAM DAC. There are some other components at the top of the board that honestly I cannot find much info about. And the board at the bottom is the GR3, and this board has the HQ2 command engine, two GE7 geometry engines, with both of them actually being on a single chip, and this board also contains the RE3 raster engine. The connector to the backplane is also on this board. The GR3 Elon also has a 24-bit Z buffer, and has a maximum output resolution of 1280 by 1024 at 72 hertz. Absolutely ridiculous stuff for 1993. This system also has the A2 audio processor, which is actually pretty neat. The A2 has two combined 16-bit DAC and ADCs that are capable of reproducing nice 48 kilohertz audio. There's also an internal speaker that honestly sounds pretty good. Now bringing it to the rear I.O., we have keyboard and mouse ports, RS-422 serial, AUI and 10 base T Ethernet for networking, Parallel, SCSI 2, all of our audio ins and outs, and the 13W3 connector for connecting our monitor, as well as some other ports on the graphics card. And on the topic of that 13W3 connector, this is where things get kind of interesting. So really, you can't use this system with any normal monitor. It has to support a thing called Sync on Green. So here's what that is. Usually in Component, you have a red, green, and blue signal. Now the green signal in this case is not only in charge of, well, the green signal, but it also has the sync signal for the monitor. So you usually have to use like these weird Dell flat panel monitors or anything like that, but no, I really don't want to do that. I really want to use my normal ViewSonic 17 GS2 from 1996 because I don't have the original monitor that this thing had. So how do we do that? 
Well, it's actually easier than you might think. I went ahead and got this 13W3 cable with customizable dip switches so I can get the correct pinout for the SGI workstations. There was a bunch of other different Unix workstations that all use 13W3, but all use different pins. So online I found this pin diagram to a bunch of different Unix workstations, and I flipped all the switches to the SGI one. So now that we have 13W3 converted to normal VGA, that still does not fix our problem. The sync signal is still on the green signal. So what do we do now? Well, that's where this little sync adapter comes into play. This box's entire duty is to take the sync signal from the green and turn it into a separate sync which most VGA monitors use, and the box gets power through the cable. Now these sync adapters are kind of hard to find. I got lucky and I found a lot of two of them on eBay for $40, but usually by itself this single component's like 150 bucks, so not necessarily like a cheap option. But if you want to use these systems with basically anything, this is kind of one of the only options. So now with this adapter figured out, I can use pretty much any color VGA monitor I want with this thing, which is exactly what I wanted. Because to me it doesn't feel right using a somewhat modern flat panel on a system like this. It just doesn't sit right with me. So here's some footage of me setting it up, turning it on for the first time. Okay, powering this on for the first time, I'm hoping that my sync adapters work. Oh, dude, this is the most beautiful thing ever. This is ever, this is all I've ever wanted, right here. Most SGI workstations run their own version of Unix, called IRIX. IRIX is based off of System 5 Unix, and has BSD extensions, and is basically built from the ground up to work really nicely with SGI workstations. IRIX is probably one of, if not my favorite operating system ever. I just love the user interface of the thing. But of course, it's all standard Unix workstation stuff, with a pretty nice and intuitive user interface, and of course your classic X server with your standard X toolkit, and it's got a terminal. And honestly, with Unix, you're probably going to end up using this a lot. And check this out, it can even play Doom. Yeah, there's nothing like playing Doom on a workstation that costs as much as a brand new RX-7 from the same year. Or like a 325IS coupe or something. Absolutely crazy stuff. Honestly, this machine is lacking quite a lot in the games department, although that totally makes sense. This is a workstation that's made for work, and because of how expensive these systems were, they never really made it to the general public, so it makes sense. So what about ray tracing in the 1990s? All you people with your fancy RTX cards, look, I can ray trace just fine on my machine. It's nowhere near real time, but it's pretty cool still. I also saw this fish demo and I was playing with it for a while. I don't even know what I'm doing with this, but I'm having fun. Now on to something that a lot more people will recognize. It's a unique system. I know this. Yeah, what if I told you that that is real? This is FSN, or Fusion. Now this is not a fully functional file manager, this was actually made to be a demo. But I think this is one of the coolest ideas of a file manager ever. And I really want to see exactly this ported to modern Linux machines. There's other projects like this that attempt to mimic it, but it seems more like a fork instead of a port. I want exactly this. Honestly, seeing this is like a dream come true for me. When I was younger watching Jurassic Park and I saw this, I thought it was the coolest thing in the entire world, and I was obsessed for probably years. FSN actually has a bunch of settings that you could use to customize the color of everything. This was awesome to play around with for a while. And this is Buttonfly. This is supposed to be a 3D demo that you can use to also access more 3D demos. Also, remember when I said that SGI workstations were used for N64 development? Well, Buttonfly was actually the inspiration of the menu in Super Mario 64. So probably somebody on the development team was playing around with Buttonfly on their workstation. Yeah, honestly, I was playing around with this thing for a really long time. So here's some more demos. Of course, there's tons more demos, but I'm not going to have enough time to show you all of them in this video, because there is a lot of them. When I got this, it actually came with a thing called IndieZone, which is basically a pack with a ton of demos. Also, that entire time I was using the internal speaker, it actually sounds really good, I wasn't joking. Welcome aboard. So 
So it's been a few weeks and honestly I've been having tons of fun with this thing. And I'll be definitely looking for some more SGI workstations to go play around with. But anyway, hit like if you liked it, dislike if you hate cool old Unix workstations, or if you just hate me. I have a lot of interesting videos coming out soon, so definitely stay tuned.